Hi. So let's see. Hopefully everybody had a good weekend. We had a good weekend here. Weekend was pretty good. Um, what happened? Not much. <laughs> Just got some work done. Saturday, Home Buddy stream was fun. Playing some Jackbox games. So yeah, that's about it. We're off to an exciting week. Oh my goodness, Rabbit Walmart, thank you so much. You pressed a button. I like that button. <laughs> that's a good button. Um, let's see, let's see what's going on this week. I think standard standard stuff this week. For the most part, I'm trying to remember if there's anything in particular that's different. Um, we'll be doing Dune this afternoon over on Jessica's stream. If we hit our goals, then we'll be doing these. Got to remember to bring mine with me. I dropped off one for Jessica last week. Got to bring my own. So that hopefully we'll see if that happens. And um, yeah. Oh, no. Hey, Hudsonizer. Sorry, does. They're suing. I thought, man, that's unfortunate. I thought they worked all that. I thought they worked all that out. Hmm. Taika's awesome. He's great. Super cool. Super cool dude. Um, yeah. So obviously there are lots of crazy things happening in the world. Uh, some of them entertaining, but most most things are just terrible. But what are you going to do? Yeah, Zard, I'll have to look into that later. But I, man, I thought I thought they were just going to leave all that alone, and it seemed like they were just kind of like waiting until people got old enough that they wouldn't care anymore. <laughs> but who knows? Sorry to hear that. Lawsuits are annoying. Okay, so let's do let's do some mythology. That'll be great. That'll be great. I have not met Taika. I've just watched interviews and things with him. Uh, all right, so last time we read some really, really great stories last time, and we ended by talking about Crete, the island, and and all the wacky stuff going on there. So we pick up with Crete. Oh, because again, so the king there, Minos, his wife, Pasiphae, fell in love with a bull and <laughs> commissioned Daedalus, the inventor, to build her, the island bull enthusiast, exactly, to build her a frame in which she could hide and have sex with the bull. And that produced the Minotaur. So here we, we are in book eight and we get to the story of Daedalus and Icarus. So again, Daedalus built the labyrinth to hide the Minotaur, the result of what he had done. And then Minos locked him up and would not let him leave. Doesn't want anybody talking about it, sharing the story of what actually happened there with his wife and the bull. So the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Homesick for homeland, Daedalus hated Crete and his long exile there, but the sea held him. Though Minos blocks escape by land or water, Daedalus said, Surely the sky is open, and that's the way we'll go. Minos's domain does not include the air. He turned his thinking toward unknown arts, changing the laws of nature. He laid out feathers in order, first the smallest, a little larger next to it, and so continued, the way that pan pipes ra rise in gradual sequence. He fastened them with twine and wax at middle, at bottom, so or so, and bent them, gently curving, so that they looked like wings of birds, most surely. Uh, if you're not familiar with the story of Daedalus and Icarus, well, hold on to your seats. And Icarus, his son, stood by and watched him, not knowing he was dealing with his downfall, stood by and watched and raised his shiny face to, light, to let a feather light as down fall on it, or stuck his thumb into the yellow wax, fooling around, the way a boy will always. Whenever a father tries to get some work done. Oh, isn't that the truth? 
Still, it was done at last, and the father hovered, poised in the moving air, and taught his son, I warn you, Icarus, fly a middle course. Don't go too low, or water will weigh the wings down. Don't go too high, or the sun's fire will burn them. Keep to the middle way. And one more thing, no fancy steering by star or constellation. Follow my lead. Now, do kids ever listen? No. No, they don't. That was the flying lesson, and now to fit the wings to the boy's shoulders. Between the work and warning, the father found his cheeks were wet with tears and his hands trembled. He kissed his son, goodbye if he had known it, rose on his wings, flew on ahead as fearful as any bird launching the little nestlings out of high nest into thin air. Keep on, keep on, he signals, follow me. He guides him in flight, O oh, fatal art, and the wings move, and the father looks back to see the sun's wings moving. Far off, far down, some fisherman is watching as the rod dips and trembles over the water. Some shepherd rests his weight upon his crook, some plowman on the handles of the plowshare, and all look up in absolute amazement at those airborne above. They must be gods! They were over Samos, Juno's sacred island, Delos and Paros toward the left, Labynthus visible to the right, and another island, Calumny, rich in honey. And the boy thought, this is wonderful, and left his father, soared higher, higher, drawing to the vast heaven, nearer the sun, and the wax that held the wings melted in the fierce heat, and the bare arms beat up and down in air, and lacking orage took hold of nothing. Father, he cried, and father, until the blue sea hushed him. The dark water men call the Icarian now. And Daedalus, father no more, called, Icarus, where are you? Where are you, Icarus? Tell me where to find you. And saw the wings on the waves and cursed his talents, buried the body in a tomb, and the land was named for Icarus. Yeah. So am I Daedalus? Uh, no, thank <laughs> I'm, I'm not so much an inventor. Uh, so yeah, so that, that didn't go well for Icarus. He flew too high. He didn't listen to his father. Flew too high. The wax holding his, the feathers onto his wings melted. And he plunged into the ocean. Sad. Um, but interesting, no transformation there. Now, Daedalus is burying his son. During the burial, a noisy partridge from a muddy ditch looked out drummed with her wings in loud approval. No other bird those days was like the partridge, newcomer to the ranks of birds. The story reflects no credit on Daedalus. His sister, ignorant of the fates, had sent her son to Daedalus as apprentice, only a youngster hardly more than twelve years old, but clever, with an inventive turn of mind. For instance, studying a fish's Fish's backbone for a model, he had notched a row of teeth in a strip of iron, thus making the first saw. And he had bound two arms of iron together with a joint to keep them both together and apart, one standing still, the other traversing in a circle. So men came to have the compass. And Daedalus, in envy, hurled the boy headlong from the high temple of Minerva, and lied about it, saying he had fallen through accident. But Minerva, kind protectress of all inventive wit, saved him in air, clothed him with plumage. He still retains his aptness in feet and wings and kept his old name, Perdix. But in the new bird form, Perdix the partridge never flies high nor nests in trees, but flutters close to the ground and the eggs are laid in hedgerows. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, so, so we get this sad story about Daedalus and Icarus. And, and then the, as though hearing us say, oh, wait, there's no transformation there. He's like, oh, there's a little addendum to that. So during the burial, there's a partridge that's hanging around who seems to be happy at what's happened. And we find out that the partridge is a new bird, as so many creatures are, that have, uh, <laughs> that have come about because of the, the transformations in this book. But... It was actually, yeah, rabbit wombat, that's true, Tra transforming from alive to dead. But um, Perdix, 
this young boy was sent to Daedalus to be an apprentice to him as a young inventor. And Daedalus was, <laughs> was so envious of this young man's ability to think and to create things that he threw him off of a roof one day. And Minerva, being kind in this case, uh, saved him from death, just turned him into a bird, and thus we have partridges. So yeah, Daedalus, not actually a good guy here, as we find out. So there. Um, okay, so then we move on to do, 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 talking about... Uh, let's see, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. So they're looking... Hello, Dover, welcome. Yes, living to dead. Okay, I, that's true. Living to dead is a is a major transformation, I, I will admit. But we we got a bird in there. We all, we're always looking for those bird transformations. Uh, okay, so we've got... Okay, so we're skipping ahead and we have people begging Theseus for help. And then we're going to go into the story of the Caledonian boar. Right, Zardoz. It, it, she's not going to like save him and let him go. She's just going to turn him into a bird. He already invented cool stuff. He invented the saw and the compass. Um, and as who was I talking to about this? But yeah, but ancient people like the Greeks, like they knew the world was round. They had mathematics. They figured out the circumference of the earth. Like it's all these flat earther people, man. It kills me. Hey, Erdensk, welcome. Okay, so the Caledonian boar. The reason for the trouble was a great boar, the servant, the avenger of outrage to Diana. For King Oeneus, in giving thanks for a rich harvest, gave the first fruits of the grain to the goddess Ceres, then wine to Bacchus, and the olive oil to golden-haired Minerva. And after he honored the country gods, paid his due homage also to all the gods of heaven. But Diana, somehow or other, slipped his mind." Her altar received no incense. Thank you for the follow, Arch Motorcycle official. Cool. But the gods are subject to anger, even as men. They will pay for this, Diana said. We may be without honor, but without vengeance, never. And the goddess loosed over Caledon a great avenger, a boar as big as a bull with bloodshot eyes, a high, stiff neck, and the bristles rising from it like spears along a wall, and hot foam flecking the shoulders, dripping from the jaws that opened with terrible grunting sounds. His tusks were long as an Indian elephant's, and lightning flashed out of his mouth, and his breath would burn the grasses. It's a pretty badass uh, <laughs> boar, right? Not only is he gigantic and just hideous and all these things to get out of him, but there's lightning in his mouth. He burns grasses with his breath. He would trample down the corn in blade or ear so that the threshing floor, the storage bin, stood empty, waiting in vain for harvest. He would tear down the heavy grapes, the trailing vines, the olive unwithering with the gray-green leaves. And cattle fell victim to him, whom neither dogs nor herdsmen nor the great bulls could frighten off. The people fled behind walls, their only hope of safety. So, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to skip over, especially if you're doing a series of sacrifices and honoring a whole bunch of gods. You don't want to leave one out. Um, a little side note: so we talked about how civilizing heroes, like especially Theseus and Heracles, and some of the other ones, they typically go on a little bit of a tour of the of wherever they the wherever they live, wherever the kingdom is. Uh, defeating monsters and making defeating monsters or criminals and making that land safe for people and so the caledonian boar is part of that cycle and if you look at what this boar is doing very specifically he's not just out killing people and killing things what is he doing he's messing up harvests he's messing up corn and grain um, and grapes and olives and cattle. So again, like he's doing very specific things that impede people's abil ability to grow um, fruits and vegetables and grain and things. So very, it's very clearly he's messing up their their civilization, their culture 
And uh, yeah, it's it's bad news. Then Meliager and young men, spurred by glory, began to come together. This Okay, so now we're going to get a list of the people. It's a great boar hunt, right? So they summon all of the heroes of that specific age. And again, as you'll see, this is an age just before, or generation just before that of the people who go to Troy. So they began to come together. The sons of Leda, the boxer and the rider, Castor and Pollux. Jason, the first shipbuilder. And those comrades, Pirithuus and Theseus, Lynceus, Idas, Canius, who once, they say, had been a woman. Hmm. Leucippus and Acastus, the javelin thrower, Hippothuus and Dryas, Phileus, Actor's two sons, and Telamon and Peleus, famous as great Achilles' father, and Admetus, Aeolus from Boeotia, Eurytion, Echion, Lelex, Hylius, Penopius, Nestor, then hardy and vigorous. Nestor was an old man in the time of the Trojan War. And a band Hippocuan sent from Amicle. Laertes, who is Odysseus's father, and Caius, Mopsus, Oikleus's son, still safe from the ruin his wife would bring him. Okay, so we get a bunch of dudes, right? And there came the pride of Arcadian woodlands, Atalanta. A buckle polished, clasped her robe at her neck. One knot held back her hair. From her left shoulder an ivory quiver hung, and with her motion resounded, and her left hand carried the bow. You would call her features girlish in a boy, or boyish in a girl. Interesting. So a bit of a tomboy, I suppose you would say. As soon as he saw her, the Caledonian hero longed for her, though the gods willed it otherwise. He felt the flame in his heart. Oh, happy man, he thought, if ever she loves a man. But neither the time nor his own sense of self-restraint would let him go any further. The greater task was waiting. There was a forest, virgin and primeval, rising above the plain and looking down over the spreading plow land. And the heroes came here and spread the nets and loosed the hounds, keen on the trail. And there was a deep valley draining the rainy rivulets from the mountains, the lowest part all marshland, where the willows, sedgegrass and reeds and bulrush grew, dense cover. And out of this, like lightning out of cloud, the boar came charging, and the weight of his onrush laid low the grove, and the great trees came crashing down. The young men shouted, but with steady hands kept the broad iron of the spearheads level. The boar came rushing on, scattered the pack, thrusting and slashing. The first spear, Echion's, went wide, glanced off a maple tree. The next one, Jason's, was thrown too far. Then Mopsus cried, If I have been your worshipper, Apollo, and, and I am still, grant me good aim. The god granted his prayer, in part at least. The spear did strike the beast, but did him little damage. For, as the weapon flew, Diana twisted the iron from the shaft, and only the wood, with no barb in it, found the mark. And raging with hotter fire than lightning, the boar's eyes burned, and the breath of the throat was hot. So even if we have characters here who are dutiful, worshipful, um, honor the gods and ask for the gods' help. Yes, Apollo will help him. The, his throw will be true, but still Diana's upset, so she's going to twist off the, the head of the spear as it's flying its straight course. As a rock flies from the catapult at walls, at towers, at soldiers, so the beast came rushing on, death-dealing, irresistible. Two men, Eupalmus and Pelagion, went down, and their companions dragged them out of danger. They could not save an Azimus who turned, to, who turned to run, was caught by a slash of the tusks, and hamstrung. Oh, excuse me. And Nestor came near missing the Trojan War, but used his spear to vault with, and went flying into the branches of a tree. From there he watched the boar, using an oak to sharpen the edge of its tusks, and then with one stroke, gashing Hippasus's thigh wide open. So there's this cute little detail here that Nestor 
use his spear to vault into a tree to get away from this boar, uh, making him officially the first pole vaulter. Castor and Pollux came riding up, showy above the others, on horses white as snow. They poised their spears, rifled them, quivering through the air. These would have ended the hunt, but the boar turned, suddenly cunning, took to the woods where neither spear nor charger could follow, though Telamon tried, and all too eager tripped over a root, and Peleus helped him rise as Atalanta sent her arrow flying. It grazed the back of the boar, struck under the ear, staining the bristles red. And Meliager was happier than Atalanta, even at her good luck. He was the first to see the blood, to point it out to his companions, to offer praise. All honor to your prowess! The men, ashamed, urged on each other, gaining courage from their own cries, flinging the spears with no particular aim, so many missiles that none of them were any use. Ancaeus, a man from Arcus, grabbed an axe and shouted, The weapons of a man are always better than any girl's. Make room for me! Diana can shield the brute from arrows, but the axe and my right hand will fix him. Swollen with pride, the bragger heaved his two-edged axe on high, reared to full height to strike, but the boar got him between the legs. First one tusk, then the other. And Ancaeus fell, and the ground was soaked in blood, smeared with his entrails. Yikes. Uh, an interesting note here that, that the axe that this braggart is using uh, has two edges on it, which there's debate because typically ancient Greek, when we see examples of Greek or Roman axes, they're typically not double headed. So like if you're thinking of an ax with two sides, but it could have a, a curve to it. So, and the curve could be two edges technically. So anyway, people talk about that. Then Ixion's, Ixion's son, Perithous, came forward, brandishing his hunting spear, with Theseus frightened, calling, Stay out of it! Keep far away, dear comrade! Dear than my own life to me, brave men can fight long range with no disgrace, and Caius brought himself hurt with his excess of daring. Uh, so in lots of stories, Theseus has, you know, it's his best friend, Perithous. <laughs> What's the matter, buddy? What's the matter? Oh, okay. You can't play with those? No. No? Okay. That's all right. Why don't you find something else to play with? <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Perithous is... <laughs> Good morning, Emma. Yeah, he's not happy about that. Uh... <laughs> So yeah, so Perithous is Theseus's best friend. He's often like in the in the plays, he tends to be like a, a foil. Like he's just there to ask Theseus questions and have Theseus give the answers. Uh, so here though, Theseus is is very very deeply afraid for his best buddy Perithous. He's like, don't don't run up close. We can throw things from afar. There there's no harm in that. There's no, you know, you don't have to be ashamed. Don't go like that other guy who walked up and got gored to death by the boar. Uh, as he spoke, he hurled his spear, bronze-tipped and heavy, and well-aimed, too. But an oak tree's leafy branch made it glance off, and the spear of Aeson's son had bad luck also, as it struck and wounded one of the hounds and pinned him to the ground. That's not good. Meliager flung two spears. I'm not sure how he did that in one go, but... He threw two. One missed, and one stuck in the monster's back, and he whirled round in circles, spouting blood and foam, and the huntsman closed in and drove a spear straight through the shoulder. And all the hunters cheered, seeking the hand that won the victory, and stood in wonder, watching the boar brought low, and covering acres, and though they thought it hardly safe to touch him, all dipped their spears in his blood. Yeah, two weapon, two weapon proficiency. Yeah, I guess. I mean, man, it would take a lot of, a lot of effort and skill to throw two spears at once at the same target. Oh, awesome, Emma. Well, thank you for tuning in. 
And Meliager, his foot upon that deadly head, was speaking to Atalanta. O oh, Arcadian maiden, the prize is yours. I share my glory with you. He gave the spoils to her, the bristling hide, the long-tusked head, and she was very happy in both the gift and the giver. But the others grudged and were angry, and a murmur rose through all the crowd, and two, the, th the sons of Thestius, shouted, Keep out of it, woman! Let our honors be ours alone! And do not trust your beauty too much because of this silly lovesick fellow. Much good he will do you. Yikes. So yeah, now we've already, we have already established Atalanta is an excellent hunter, very proficient. She was the first one to wound this boar. Um, it's, it wasn't clear who actually killed the boar. So when they finally get the thing, when they come up upon the thing's body, Meliager is giving honors to Atalanta. Yes, because he's in love with her, but also because she was just as deserving as anyone, if not more. And some of these toxic dudes are upset about that. They took the gift from her, from, from him the right of giving. This was more than Meliager could stand for. Learn the difference, you robbers, between threatening and doing, he snarled at them, and drove the evil steel deep in Plexippus's heart. And as his brother Toxius stood doubting by, wishing for vengeance and fearing his death, his time ran out for thinking, and Meliager's spear, warmed with the blood of its first victim, was warmed again, and quickly with the fresh blood of brother and companion. So yeah, so these jerks trying to take the glory away from Atalanta and then Meliager just murders them because <laughs> sometimes that's what you need to do. Uh, and again, so that's the end of one story and no transformation other than, okay, the transformation of the boar from alive to dead, <laughs> but no other one. Um, I think I'm going to skip this next story. So we can move on to something a little bit more interesting. Yeah, you gotta gotta get rid of the dude bros. So here again we have multiple stories within stories. Hello, Darth Kaios. Welcome. So we have stories within stories. People telling stories about other people telling stories. Uh, we'll, we'll unravel it when we need to. Uh, but now we're going to read the story of Baucus and Philemon. Baucus and Philemon. And this one's kind of cute. An oak tree stands beside a linden in the Phrygian hills. There's a low wall around them. I have seen the place myself. A prince once sent me there to land ruled by his father. Um, again, like I said, we're 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 in a, a nested story here. Uh, let me see if I can figure out who is actually talking. <laughs> um, I think Perithuis is talking here. They're talking to a they're talking to a river. Theseus and Perithuis are talking to Achilus, the river. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Not far off, a great marsh lies, once habitable land, but now a playground full of coots and divers. And yes, it says coots. C-O-O-T-S. Coots. <laughs> Sorry about the children. They're very loud this morning. Um, oh, cool, Darth Kaios. Yeah, um, my... Oh, it's a kind of bird. Oh, that makes sense. Coots and divers. Yeah, that's... Well, that... That makes perfect sense. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> uh, Darth Kaios, yeah, we, um, on, on Jessica Lynn Verdi's channel, Jessica Nerdy, we do, we've, we're reading the Dune series out loud, and, um, yeah, and I've been doing mythological stories. We've done several different things over the, over the weeks and months, but, uh, but yeah, reading Ovid's Metamorphoses, reading, discussing, going back and forth. Uh, yeah, so we have coots and divers, lots of, Lots of birds. Oh, that's great. Jupiter came here once upon a time. 
disguised as mortal man, and Mercury, his son, came with him, having laid aside both wand and wings. They tried a thousand houses looking for rest. They found a thousand houses shut in their face. Thank you for the follow, Darth Kaios. All right, so here we have, I'll give you a little bit of a little bit of a backstory. So we've seen before stories of the gods checking in on humans and testing them and then deciding if humans are worth letting them live <laughs> or wiping them out or, you know, what they're going to do. So we don't have we don't have much of a backstory here, but we just dive in in that yes, Jupiter and Mercury in disguise are going around to houses, knocking on doors and seeing how the people will treat them. And a thousand houses have shut the doors in their faces. But one at last received them, a humble cottage thatched with straw and reeds. A good old woman, Bacchus, and her husband, a good old man, Philemon, used to live there. <clears throat> they had married young. They had grown old together in the same cottage. They were very poor, but faced their poverty with cheerful spirit and made its burden light by not complaining. So very, very stoic ideals here. It would do you little good to ask for servants or masters in that household, for the couple were all the house. Both gave and followed orders. So when the gods came to this little cottage, ducking their heads to enter, the old man pulled out a rustic bench for them to sit on, and Bacchus spread a homespun cover for it, and then she poked the ashes around a little, still warm from last night's fire, and got them going with leaves and bark, and blew at them a little without much breath to spare, and added kindling. The wood split fine and the dry twigs made smaller by breaking them over the knee and put them under a copper kettle. And then she took the cabbage her man had brought from the well-watered garden and stripped the outer leaves off. Wow, that's like a 20-line sentence. And Philemon reached up with a forked stick for the side of bacon that hung below the smoky beam and cut it, saved up for so long, a fair-sized chunk, and dumped it in the boiling water. They made conversation to keep the time from being too long, and brought a couch with willow frame and feet, and on it they put a sedge grass mattress, and above it such drapery as they had, and did not use except on great occasions. Even so, it was pretty worn. It had only cost a little when purchased new, but it went well enough with a willow couch. And so the gods reclined. I love all these little details about how, like, Okay, look, they're really poor. <laughs> like, really, really poor. But they're doing this the best that they can. They're sharing everything they have to share. Bacchus, her skirts tucked up, was setting the table with trembling hands. One table leg was wobbly. A piece of shell fixed that. <laughs> they even have a wobbly table, so she sticks... It's like, um, like the matchbook. She sticks it under one of the, the legs. She scoured the table, made level now with a handful of green mint, put on the olives, black or green, and cherries preserved in dregs of wine, endive and radish and cottage cheese and eggs turned over lightly in the warm ash with shells unbroken. The dishes, of course, were earthenware, and the mixing bowl for wine was the same silver, and the goblets were beech, the inside coated with yellow wax. So we get some really interesting details about ancient... Um, earthenware and what what materials were used for what things among those who at least are perceived as being poor so there was some silver in in their stuff but not a lot no time at all and the warm food was ready and wine brought out of no particular vintage and pretty soon they had to clear the table for the second course here there were nuts and figs and dates and plums and apples in wide baskets. Remember how apples smell? <laughs> and purple grapes fresh from the vines, and a white honeycomb as centerpiece, and all around the table shone kindly faces, nothing mean or poor or skimpy in good will. The mixing bowl, as often as it was drained, kept filling up all by itself, and the wine was never lower. And this was strange and scared them when they saw it. Because even kindly good old folk, they have to have reverence and awe when the 
uh, divine manifests itself. They raised their hands and prayed, a little shaky, Forgive us, please, our lack of preparation, our meager fare. They had one goose, a guardian, watchdog, he might be called, of their estate, and now decided they had better kill him to make their offering better. But the goose was swift of wing, too swift for slow old people to catch, and they were weary from the effort and could not catch the bird who fled for refuge, or so it seemed, to the presence of the strangers. Don't kill him, said the gods, and then continued, We are gods, you know. This wicked neighborhood will pay as it deserves to. Do not worry. You will not be hurt, but leave the house. Come with us, both of you, to the mountaintop. <laughs> There's some kind of shortage of apples. I think that I think that little note, it's um it's 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 dashed out. I think that has to do with the with the story that we're nested in. <laughs> but it it's not worth not worth diving into. So yeah, so these poor old people, well, literally poor old people, uh, they see they see a manifestation of the divine. The wine keeps refilling itself and they freak out. They realize, oh my god, these these are gods here. What do we we need to honor them more. Uh, <laughs> we have to kill our poor goose, our watchdog. <laughs> But wouldn't you know it, it's too fast for them and they can't catch it. But the gods say, all right, calm down. We are gods. All of your jerk neighbors, they're going to be punished. But come with us to the mountaintop and you'll be okay. Obeying with staff and cane, they made the long climb, slowly and painfully and rested, where a bowman could reach the top with a long shot, looked down, saw water everywhere. Only their cottage standing above the flood. So again, depending on the story, Ovid here in the Metamorphoses will skip over details that most of his readers or people listening to the stories would, would already know. So Bacchus and Philemon here is, it's, a, it's the flood myth that we are very familiar with from lots of other cultures. Uh, we just recently read it in the Epic of Gilgamesh. But here, the gods have essentially a little bit of backstory. Jupiter has Jupiter has realized that humans are pretty terrible. So takes Mercury in disguise. They go around looking to see if there's anybody worth saving, anybody who is honorable and good among humans. Uh, and again, we've seen this story before, but it's finally it's Bacchus and Philemon. They are... They are decent, they are good, so they are saved from the flood that wipes out at least all the other people in this area. And while they wandered and wept a little for their neighbor's troubles, the house they used to live in, the poor quarters small for the two of them, became a temple. Forked wooden props turned into marble columns. The thatch grew brighter yellow, the roof was golden, the doors were gates, most wonderfully carved. The floor that used to be of earth was marble. Jupiter, calm and grave, was speaking to them. You are good people, worthy of each other. Good man, good wife. Ask us for any favor, and you shall have it. And they hesitated, asked, Could we talk it over just a little? And talked together apart, and then Philemon spoke for them both. What we would like to be is to be priests of yours, and guard the temple, and since we have spent our happy years together, may one hour take us both away. Let neither outlive the other, that I may never see the burial of my wife, nor she perform that office for me. And the prayer was granted. As long as life was given, they watched the temple. And one day, as they stood before the portals, both very old, talking the old days over, each saw the other put forth leaves. Philemon watched Bacchus changing. Bacchus watched Philemon, and as the foliage spread, they still had time to say, Farewell, my dear, and the bark closed over, sealing their mouths. And even to this day, the peasants in that district show the stranger the two trees close together, and the union of oak and linden in one. The ones who told me the story, sober ancients, were no liars. Why should they be? Okay, so then it picks up again with the framing story. So these old, these wonderful beautiful old people. They're honored by the gods because they honored the gods. 
and they're given basically any wish you want. And they say, well, let us stay here. This magnificent temple that's been transformed from our house, let us be the caretakers of it. And uh, let us die together, not at the same time. Oh, so yeah, so this is, so this is, it sounds like Bacchus, but this is a, this is just a human named, yeah, B-A-U-C-I-S. Just, just a human dude. Uh, and yeah, so they are granted that wish. So they grow very old. And then at the same time, they both witness each other starting to turn into trees. And they just have enough time to say, farewell, my dear, I love you. And they're turned into trees. So we get, we get our transformations. All right. So now we have a long story here. Man. All right, we're going to skip the story of Erizikthon, and we're going to dive into some stories relating to and about Hercules. Dun, dun, dun. And so the ends were born, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're still listening to... So there's still a river talking to Theseus and Perithous. We're, we're still in that uh, this cycle here. So now we're into book nine, starting with the story of Achilles's duel for Deianira. And again, we're throwing a lot of names out there. If you if you have questions or or uh, confusion, please yeah let, let me know because there are a lot of names. So Achilles, who is a river god, has been telling the story of other people, and his story ended with a groan and a hand raised feebly toward his forehead. So all of a sudden, he's been talking to these two heroes for a long time, telling stories, and then he finishes the story and is like, oh, my head. All right, and then we dive into book nine. When Theseus asked him why the groan, the gesture, the mutilated forehead, the old river with unadorned and reed-crowned hair made answer, a sorrowful story for what loser tells his battles with any pleasure? But I will tell you, it was not so bad to lose as it was glorious to have made the fight, and the greatness of the winner gives me some satisfaction. You have heard, perhaps, of Deianira, once most lovely, the hope of many suitors, and I myself was one of them, and came to her father's house. Receive me as a son-in-law, I said, and Hercules said that too, and all the others left it for us to settle. Uh, so this is Deianira. So Deianira is a beautiful, wonderful mortal woman. And she's so beautiful that all these people come, all these suitors come from far and wide to try to win her hand. Among them, <clears throat> the river, the river god, Achilles and Hercules. So there, there's a little bit of competition between these two, and Achilles is talking about Hercules here. So Hercules, he began by claiming Jove as father, did some bragging about his labors, and some mission or other his stepmother had sent him. I was thinking no god should yield to a mortal. Hercules had not yet then become a god. I am, I said, a god, lord of the river flowing through your own realms, King Oeneus. I am no stranger from foreign shores, but one from your own country. It should not count against me that Queen Juno is without hatred for me, or that labors have not been in punishments inflicted on me. So basically he's like, this guy, Hercules, what, what is, what's so great about him? Yeah, he did, he did amazing things, but he was forced to. As for your parentage, Hercules, you claim Alcmena as your mother. That makes Jove what kind of father to you? Either a product of your imagination, or, if real, a cheater, and your mother an adulteress. Ha <laughs> ha. Take that. So, take your choice. Which would you rather be, liar or bastard? He stood there glaring at me, controlling his savage temper very badly, and finally growled, I am a better talker with fists than tongue. Provided I can win the fight, 
I grant you the debater's laurel. So he's like, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm just going to fight you. You can win at talking. That's fine. I had talked so big, I knew I had to fight him. So I slipped out of my green robe, held up my hands, assumed the proper pose. He took handfuls of dust and sprinkled them over my body and made his own turn golden with the dust. We could grip each other better so. Uh, and that's a reference to ancient athletics and wrestling and boxing. Um, <clears throat> athletes, very briefly, but ancient athletes would cover their bodies with oil to help with perspiration and um, and then yeah so then either they you would scrape it off but then if you were gonna do some sort of a combat sport uh, there was like basically like chalk kind of dust that you could put on so that's what that note is here uh, his hold aimed at my neck my flashing legs he shifted from one feint to another but I was heavy heavy and big I stood there like a sea wall which the waves beat in vain we both gave way a little and came together again and held there, determined not to yield. <clears throat> foot trampling foot. And I leaned forward, grabbed his hands, my fingers bent back his fingers. And my forehead pushed against his forehead. So obviously they are wrestling. <clears throat> Hercules is well known as a, a very powerful wrestler. I have seen bulls battle in just the way, in just that way, for the most shining heifer, with the rest of the herd watching in fear and trembling, uncertain who will win. Three times he struggled to throw me off, and the fourth time he loosened the hold I had, and hit me hard, and swung me, I have to tell the truth, in half a circle and jumped on my back. I ought to have some credit, there would be no sense in telling lies about it for holding up this mountain that weighed on me. Still, I got out of it. My sweating arms managed to break the hold, but he rushed at me, all winded as I was, gave me no time to get my strength back, and he grabbed my neck, and I went down and knew the taste of the dirt. Inferior in strength, I tried to cun in, became a serpent, slid away and twisted my body into looping coils, kept darting my tongue and hissing at him. All he did was laugh. I strangled serpents in my cradle, he cried. You might, Achilles, be bigger than some snakes I have seen, and still be only a little fraction of the one at Lerna, who multiplied with every wound and lost a hundred heads and grew a double number each time I struck one off. A tree of serpents which I cut down brought low. What do you think will happen to you in that disguise of yours, in that false armor? Yeah, it's not... It's not the best idea to transform into a snake in front of Hercules and be like, look at me, I'm a snake now. When Hercules literally was strangling snakes as a baby and then defeated the Hydra and other things. He got hold of my neck, squeezed, so I thought my throat was gripped with pincers. I fought against the thumbs that pressed my jaws until I took another form, a bull's. But his arms went over the left side of my shoulders. He dragged me down. He pinned my horns to the ground. And this was not enough. His rough right hand broke off one horn and pulled it from my forehead. And this the naiads took and filled it full of fruits and fragrant flowers. And the good goddess, whose name is Plenty, was made the richer by it. So <laughs> this poor river god trying every, every trick he has to get away from Hercules. Hercules just beats him down at every step. Uh, and this little note there at the end, so Hercules breaks off one of his horns as he's transformed into a bull. And yeah, these naiads who are uh, river goddesses, they took it, they fill it with fruits and flowers, gives it to the goddess whose name here is Plenty. And this is the cornucopia. This is the, the horn of full of good things that we see in artwork and stuff, Thanksgiving, things like that. His story ended, and a nymph apparelled after the matter, manner of Diana came with flowing hair, bringing the horn, all full of autumn's store, prime fruits to grace the table. And when day came and the sun's rays were gilding the mountain summits with morning, 
they took their leave, all these young men, before the stream ran quiet, before the waters were glassy smooth. Their host hid in the waves the mutilated horn, the country features, all uninjured, really, except in loss of pride, and so his forehead he keeps concealed with reeds or willow branches. So poor Achilles. He's actually okay, but he's shamed and covers his forehead. So now we're going to continue with stories of Hercules. <coughs> and I think we'll be able to get through this one. All right, I think we can get through one more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The horn, the horn of plenty. <coughs> All right. The story of Hercules, Nessus, and Deonera. Nessus. But the centaur Nessus burned for Deonera as if an arrow had pierced him. Hercules was coming home with his bride and reached the river Evenus, swollen to flood with the rains of winter, too dangerous to cross with its whirling eddies. It was not for himself that Hercules was worried, but what of Deonera? At this point, Nessus came stalking up. He knew the fords, he told them. You swim it, Hercules. I'll carry her over. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not sure if anyone has is familiar with this story. But yeah, so Nessus is a centaur. Um, I assume everyone who's watching, listening knows what a centaur is. But human from the waist up, horse from the waist down and back. Uh, we can all have the debate. If a centaur wore pants, what would the pants look like? The only animal with two sets of rib cages. Uh, yeah, so this centaur, I'm sorry about, I got kids this way, gardeners out that way. Hopefully it's not too loud. Uh, yeah, so Nessus sees Deonera, Hercules' woman, his wife, and wants her. So when Hercules comes to this mighty river, he's got to get across. How am I going to do this? Nessus appears and is like, hey, hey, bro, you can swim across. You're, you're tough. You're strong. I'll carry Daenerys across for you. So Hercules entrusted her to Nessus, and she was pale and trembling, afraid of the river, afraid of Nessus. But Hercules, undaunted, threw his club and bow across the stream, but wearing the lion skin and quiver, faced the river, knowing that he must finish what he started, <clears throat> and had no hesitation, did not even look for the smoothest current, scorning favors from any river. So Hercules is like, Psh, I don't care about this river. I'm just going to dive in. I'm not even going to look for a, for a clear spot. So he reached the bank, was picking up his bow, and heard his bride calling for help. Nessus was full of evil. So, Hercules cried, this double-bodied monster has so much pride of strength and swiftness in him, he turns to violence. Now hear me, Nessus. Let things of mine alone. The wheel your father rides in eternal hell should be warning against forbidden loves. Uh, so that's a reference to the story of Ixion, which we can talk about some other time. Long story. Hey, squirrel, welcome. Uh, but Ixion is one of the famous people suffering a, a special torture down in the underworld. You will not escape me, no matter how much you trust your vaunted horsepower. Get it? I will catch up with you, if not by running, by deeds, by wounds. And as he spoke, he proved it. The arrow pierced the back, came out at the shoulder. So two wounds bled, and the blood had poison in it. For the barb was dipped in the venom of the serpent, and Nessus wrenched it loose. I shall not die, he thought, without revenge. And gave his robe, dyed in warm crimson, as a gift to her, the girl he would have ravished as a token to help to make her love him. Okay, so again, we get a much longer story crammed down into just a couple lines here. So essentially, Hercules is like, well, if I can't catch up running, because I'm already on the other side of the stream now, you're a centaur, you're really fast, I'm just going to shoot you. So he shoots him with an arrow, and the arrow goes through uh, Nessus's chest and back, so there are two wounds. Uh, there, 
<laughs> the arrow had been poisoned in the blood of the Hydra. So it is so there's po there's venom, there's poison from mixed with Nessus's centaur blood, and he the blood drenches the clothing that he's wearing, and he takes it off and gives it to Daenerys and says, basically, this will be like a special token you can use for for love. Yeah, that's that's a real thing. That's a thing you should you should take and use. Time went on, and Hercules's great deeds and Juno's hatred spread all over the world. He was returning victorious from Ocalia, making ready to pay his vows to Jove, when Rumor, the goddess Rumor, lover of truth and falsehood both, the tattletale who makes big things of little ones, comes rushing to Deonera, and her story has it that Hercules burns with passion for Aeoli. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of a lot of things that weren't weren't so good in these in these stories. Uh, so yeah, so Hercules goes off to a distant land, comes back victorious, but he has with him a servant, a slave named Aeoli, and rumor tells Daenerys that Hercules is in love with this girl. <clears throat> she loves him. She believes it. She is frightened. Gives way at first to tears, pities herself, makes her grief grow by weeping, and recovers a little, thinking, What's the good of weeping? Tears would delight my rival, and she is coming, is on her way. What I had better do is hurry, figure out something, while I can, before she is in my bed. Shall I complain? Shall I keep silent? Shall I go again to Caledon, or linger here? Shall I forsake this house, or keep her out? I might remember Meliager was my brother, might plan some desperate deed, murder my rival, to show her what a woman in grief and outrage can do by way of vengeance. So her mind wavers in all directions, but at last she thinks it's best to send the robe of Nessus, dyed with his blood, to help to make her love him. To send this on to Hercules, not knowing what she is given, the cause of her own sorrow. She hands it over to Lycus, unsuspecting and with most gentle words, bids him deliver the robe to Hercules. And the hero takes it, throwing it over his shoulder, Lerna's poison. He was offering incense on the rising flames, praying and pouring wine on the marble altar, and the warmth brought out the virulence of the garment, whose molten deadliness spread over his limbs. And while he could... His usual fortitude kept back his groans, but even his endurance could not hold out forever. And in his madness, he knocked the altars down, filled Woody Oita with horrible cries, tried to tear off the robe, and where he tore it, there it tore the skin. Or, where it could not be torn, clung to the limbs, or burned to the naked muscle and great bones. So we're going to see some, like, really... Gross stuff happening in this story. <laughs> That's squirrel. That is absolutely what I try to do. So yeah. So this, the, the garment is it, essentially it's melting onto Hercules, melting into his skin. He's tearing it off. It's tearing his own skin off. It's pretty gross. As the blood hissed, as white-hot metal does, dipped in cold water, and the mixture boiled, poison and blood together, the hungry fever eating his very marrow, and the tendons half-burnt made cracking sounds, and livid sweat poured from all over his body. He raised his hands. Gloat on my suffering! Gloat, O cruel Juno! Sate that relentless heart, watching me burn! Or if an enemy, and I am yours, that much is certain, could find some reason for pity, take away this life of mine. Sick from its torture, hateful, born for anguish. Stepmother, I ask a favor, give me death! Was it for this that I subsided Busiris, who fouled the temples of the gods with blood of strangers slain? Was it for this I lifted Antaeus from supporting earth? For this slew Geryon, dragged off Cerberus? My hands seized the bull's horns, and Elis, 
was the gainer with the Parthenian groves, Stymphalian waters. So basically he's referencing all of the uh, labors that he's already done. He's like, I already did all of these great things and now I'm suffering. Put me out of my misery. My hands brought back the golden belt. My hands, the golden apples from the sleepless dragon. Centaurs could not resist me, nor the boar that ravaged Arcady. I slew the hydra that gained by its own loss, and little good that did the monster. And the Thracian horses fed fat on human blood. The mangers filled with human bodies I found, and when I found them, tore them to pieces. These were the hands that choked the lion of Nemea. These the shoulders that held the weight of the world one time for Atlas. Juno grew tired of giving orders. I was never tired of obeying them. But now a new doom comes upon me, one I cannot fight off by arms or courage, and the fire devours my lungs and feeds on all my members. But still, Eurystheus keeps his health. Who is there to think that gods exist? So, racked with pain, he wandered over Oita, as a tiger drags off the spears that wounded him when the hunter has fled in fear. There you could see him groaning, gnashing his teeth, still raging and tearing at the garment, leveling trees against the mountains, or holding out his hands to his father's heaven. Then he saw Lycus trembling, lying hidden under the hollow of a rock, and pain roused all his fury. You were the one who did it. You, Lycus, brought me death. And Lycus shuddered, turned pale, tried to say something, came to his knees in supplication, and found himself raised high, whirled through the air three times, four times, flung far toward the Eubean waters as a stone flies from a catapult. And high in the air, in the cold wind, he felt his body stiffen. As showers in cold wind are turned to snow, and snow to sleet, and sleet to hail. So Lycus, hurled through the air by Hercules, grew colder. The blood by fear made rigid, and the body all stone and hardness. To this very day, Eubean soldiers show the traveler a low rock rising, as if with human features out of the water, and they call it Lycus. And will not step there, they are never sure it would not feel their tread and be offended. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all, the, all that talking while the, the, the flesh is melting off of his bones. So yeah, Hercules is just raging across the mountainside, sees poor Lycus, the one who had delivered the garment to him, uh, whips him around, just hurls him through the air. He's saved, from at least from being dashed to his death, turned into a rock that sailors still say you can see sticking up out of the water. And Hercules cut down trees from lofty Oita to make himself a funeral pyre and called on Poyas' son to take the bow, the quiver, the arrows that would visit Troy again. And Philoctetes had the fire made ready under the barrow, and as the flames went roaring above, around, Hercules spread as quilt the lion's skin and used his club as pillow and lay there, no more troubled than a feaster at a great banquet, garland crowned, among the brimming cups of wine. So yeah, Hercules is so badass that he's he's literally dying. But even so, <clears throat> he cuts down trees to make his own funeral pyre, calls up a buddy to, to give him his uh, bow and arrow, sets out his all of his stuff and lays down to die. And the flames grew stronger, spread, sought the carefree limbs of its despiser, and the gods were troubled for Earth's champion, as Jove with joyful voice addressed them. Gods, this fear of yours is my delight. My heart rejoices that the people I rule and father is grateful, that your favor guards my son. He has earned that favor by his deeds, but I am under obligation for that favor. Let not your hearts be troubled. Oita's flames are nothing, and the conqueror will conquer these also. Only his mother's heritage, his mortal part, will feel the fire. That part which comes from me, no flames will ever master. It will live always, safe from death and burning. 
and I shall take it to the shores of heaven when it is done with earth. And you, I trust, will all of you approve. If anyone should grieve that Hercules becomes a god, should be unwilling that he have this honor, well, let him grieve, and let him grant, and let him, even against his will, own it as proper. The gods agreed, and even royal Juno looked willing enough, only a little sullen at Jove's last words, aimed as she knew at her. And meanwhile, anything that fire could conquer was conquered. There was nothing left, a form, a shape, not to be recognized, of Hercules with nothing human about it, only spirit, the proof of Jove, shining the way a serpent shines with the old skin cast when the new life glistens. <clears throat> so Hercules put off the mortal body, thriving, and in his better part becoming greater, more worthy of veneration, and Jove raised him through hollow clouds to the bright stars, a rider in the chariot drawn by the four heavenly horses. And Atlas, who bears heaven on his shoulders, felt the new weight. And Sthenelus' son Eurystheus held to his ancient grudge at Hercules, and troubled with long-suffering for her son, Alcmena had one comforter, Aeoli, to whom to tell her sorrows, an old woman proud of the worldwide glory of her son, unhappy in her misfortunes. This Aeoli, by Hercules' command, had married Hylas, <clears throat> was pregnant by him, and Al Okay, and then we get more stories. So, we get... <clears throat> Excuse me. We get here... There were a couple transformations. Uh, the transformation of poor Lycus being thrown through the air. And then... As Hercules is on the pyre, as he's burning, Jupiter makes this proclamation. Look, gods. Hercules has done a lot. He's worthy. We're gonna. I'm gonna make him a god. And uh, if you have any problem with that, basically shut your mouth. I don't want to hear it. But we have this interesting split that it says that whatever is mortal of Hercules does die and burns, but the greater part of him goes up to heaven to be a god with the other gods. <clears throat> and that's why in some of the stories there is a there is a shade of. Uh, Hercules down in the underworld because that's the mortal part that did die and, and went there. Oh yeah, squirrel. Wednesday. Woohoo. It's on its way. <coughs> cool. So that will be the end of our mythology reading for today. Got some good stories today. Next time. So we're going to hear a little bit more about Hercules. And then what is next? Conus and Biblis. Ooh, that's a long one. Iphis and Ianthe. Yeah, there are a lot of really famous stories in here. Ooh, and then Orpheus. That's a good story. Cyparissus. Apollo and Hyacinthus. Ganymede. Oh, yeah. Still lots of really good <laughs> really good stories in here. Cool, Darth Kaios. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, yes. So today, five o'clock Pacific time, we'll be on with Jessica over at her channel. We'll be reading, continuing on with Dune, um, Children of Dune, to be specific. And uh, if we hit our goals, we'll be eating these. So that should be fun. Let's see who is on and if there's anybody on that I can pass it over to now. Do a little raid in. Uh, give me one second to boot it up here. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see um, what what language, what version of reading we do. Um, Darth Kaios, yeah. So that's going to be over on Jessica's channel. That's Jessica, it's Jessica Nerdy is the channel, and that's at 5, 5 p.m. Pacific time on Mondays. Uh, give me one second here. Otherwise, mm, probably, 
for now, I'll say normal streaming this week for me. Uh, things may change toward the end of the week, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Okay, who is on now? Nobody. Mostly nobody. Okay. Well, uh, you know what? Let's let's check out. Let's check out Realm of Misfits. See what they're doing. They do some cool stuff over there. Let's let's see what they're up to. Uh, yes. Eight p.m. Eastern for those. <laughs> West Coast, worst coast, East Coast, best coast. I don't know. East Coast. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining me today. I love reading this stuff and talking about it. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Tune in for Dune and possibly chips later on. Otherwise, I'll see everybody tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be looking at toys. All right. Bye, everybody. We're going to go and see what realms of misfits are up to. Bye-bye. Ooh, that's hot. <clears throat> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> 